Even a four inch diameter bagel, nine teaspoons of sugar. Regular can of soda, lemon lime, for example, seven teaspoons of sugar. And all it took was 20 teaspoon sugar equivalent, which is very easy to get to. If you have some fried food, some French fries, a soda, you're there. And if you're snacking on potato chips, but a bag of potato chips is 38 teaspoons of sugar, eight ounces, and but you can't eat just one because the more carbohydrate you eat, the more you crave. And with everybody staying home, I'm in Houston, everybody's staying home. You walk in the streets, there's nobody there. You don't want, you know, you drive down the street, there's zero. So what are they doing? Pizza delivery, cakes, cookies, snacks, all carbs. They're doing the worst possible thing in the world. And this looked at over time, what the carbohydrates did and, and how much. And if you're eating three or four times a day carbohydrates, you're wiping out your immune system up to 20 hours a day. Professor Brian Peskin, welcome back to the Keto Camp Podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And this time, my voice is here. The allergies are gone. <laughs> the last time I could barely speak. It wasn't a cold. It was allergies. And I used to be highly, highly susceptible to regular grass. I'd be bedridden three times a year. But since taking the right essential oils, that's gone way down. This is the first time I was hit, maybe six months ago when I saw you. Uh, nothing like it, but something very virulent came out of uh, Austin. But still, I recovered fine. That's the big thing. And you know what? You're referring to the episode Keto Camp 45 episode uh, where we talked about saturated fat, the benefits of saturated fat, the best time for carbs, the dangers of vegetable oils. And you know what? Even with your voice being shot that day, it was it's still one of the top downloads for my podcast. Uh -huh. So go listen to that if you haven't listened to it already. It's available on the Keto Camp podcast. You can listen to Brian's story. We get into all that. But today's episode is more relevant to what's going on in the, in the world, which is such a unique time right now. For the first time in my lifetime, Brian, the world is dealing with the same problem together, which is the coronavirus. And you have sent me some yeah. brilliant research articles on Thanks. what's going on. And the first one I'd love to start with, we'll get right into it, is why are diabetics more susceptible to the coronavirus? Yeah, this was known actually in the 70s. But turns out essential fatty acids, which are EFAs, I call them essential EFAs or parent EFAs, your body has to get them from food. And then it converts parent omega-6, parent omega-3 into all what's called long-chain metabolites. Well, in diabetics, in people undergoing chemotherapy, disease, it's known what's called the delta-6 desaturous enzyme that ends up making these oils longer for different use in the body is impaired. And what is immediately impaired is called PGE1. It's prostaglandin series one. It's number one because it's the most important by far. And it's enormously tied to the immune response and stopping the overproduction of it's called cytokines leukotrienes these are the inflammatory response when you get a virus or you get an allergy the people are dying of the coronavirus not because of the virus itself because of what they call the chitosine cascade there's way too much produced and that's why you have the bronchial problems and you're sneezing and your nose is you know problematic that's the problem, and these oils fix that. But in the diabetics, it's impaired. And then when the virus comes in, it's impaired even more. So PGE1 is critical to vasodilation. It dilates the blood vessels naturally, so you get more blood supply. What is more blood supply? More oxygen. Oxygen kills everything. Ask any physician in the world, how do I kill an infection? Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. That is the number one thing. So by more blood flow, more oxygen directly, and you get the anti-inflammatory, 
and it has a cascade of effects. But this is a major, major problem. And there's ways around that. If you take an oil that contains the precursor of what PGE-1 would need to do its thing, you bypass that. And that's a trick, if you want to call it that. It's actually darn good science, so we can actually have diabetics that are impaired and bring them back to very, very close to normal. And this is why in Louisiana, 41% of the people that died from the coronavirus were diabetic. They fell off the chair. Then I saw an interview on TV with a doctor in New York, not New York City, but I think it was Queens or something. It was saying 14 out of 15 of the patients that died in his hospital, diabetic. And he goes, I started researching viruses and diabetes. I saw nothing. Well, this paper, I believe, was uh, 1973. So if I found it, this is the problem then in medicine. They never go to the past. They always act like we're just starting today and we know nothing of the past. Well, if you're from the brilliant engineer from 50 years ago, who used the brilliant engineer from 50 years ago before him, so we have three series of brilliant engineering marvels to make our fourth one, like the iPhone or something like that, built on many, many brilliant engineers. In medicine, do you ever hear anybody from the past being mentioned? No. They act like it doesn't exist. They act like there's no biochemistry or physiology that exists. Everything to these guys today is a study or genetics. And that will not help you one bit. The genetics have nothing to do with this whatsoever. And in 99.5% of all diseases, they don't. It's called epigenetic. It means what you eat. And when you're overdosing on carbohydrates, 20 teaspoons of sugar, and we'll talk about what does that mean, because it's always in millimoles per deciliter. That's the way a diabetic endocrinologist or diabetic physician would, would talk about that. I'm an engineer by training, so I don't care about millimoles per deciliter. I live in a world of teaspoons. How many teaspoons of sugar are in a normal person's bloodstream is the first question I asked. And I did a simple calculation, a little bit of algebra. Turned out it was less than a teaspoon. You know, this can't possibly be right. What did I screw up? It's got to be 10, 100. You know, we're told to eat a lot of carbs, right? This was many years ago. This was two and a half decades ago. So it was, my goodness, less than a teaspoon of sugar. And I gave it to some colleagues. And they said, yeah, you're right. It's less than a teaspoon. Because I was one of the first to convert to millimoles per deciliter in the teaspoons of sugar and categorize all the foods by that and the portions by that. It was called the sugar rater. This was very much in the beginning. And then other people have finally copied it. About it took them about 10 years. But the average person can know what they're eating. A pizza, for example, is 12-inch pizza. That is easy to eat on your own. It's 38 teaspoon equivalents of sugar. This paper showed if you eat 20 teaspoon equivalents, you virtually have no leukocyte, which is your number one white cell uh, immune booster and it attacks viruses and everything else in your bloodstream, it fails. You basically have no immune system for two hours and the result lasts over five hours. So if you're doing what your average nutritionist or healthcare professional says and eats five to six times a day, they're typically carbohydrate loaded, you are wiping out your immune system, and this precisely explains why the diabetics are huge in population to get this virus. There's no need for it, so you want to minimize it. But here's a couple of numbers. Every 20 calories of carbohydrate, and I hope your listeners will write this down, 20 calories of carbohydrate is a teaspoon of sugar. Every five grams is a teaspoon of sugar, same thing. The only thing you subtract out of of carbohydrate is fiber because fiber is food for a termite. We do not eat fiber. It's not considered food for a human being. And there's physicians out there telling you, you need it, you need it, you need it for the bacteria in your gut. 
I'll tell you this, 1999 and 2000, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, premier medical journals in the world and in the United States, both gave the results of fiber and colon cancer. The women eating the most fiber got the most colon cancer. Fiber is indigestible cellulose, cardboard, wood. Would you ever eat a chunk of wood? Well, that's fiber. And it doesn't even matter if it's the, the soluble type where it dissolves in water. So fiber is horrible. You don't need carbs to get fiber. That's ridiculous. Babies have no fiber whatsoever for the first six months or first two or three years of the breastfed. There's no fiber. So anybody telling you you need fiber is insane because when you're youngest, you need the most nutrients possible if it was something that's going to help you. So if the baby didn't get the fiber for breast milk, which they don't, you would expect all these problems. They have none. They're, they thrive like you wouldn't believe. So the carbohydrates are absolutely horrible, but even a four inch diameter bagel, nine teaspoons of sugar, regular can of soda, lemon lime, for example, seven teaspoons of sugar. And all it took was 20 teaspoon sugar equivalent, which is very easy to get to. If you have some fried food, some French fries, a soda, you're there. And if you're snacking on potato chips, a bag of potato chips is horrible, and you can eat the whole thing. It's 38 teaspoons of sugar is uh, the pizza, is, is, is the potato chips, rather. The pizza was 32. But a bag of potato chips is 38 teaspoons of sugar, eight ounces, and but you can't eat just one because the more carbohydrate you eat, the more you crave. And with everybody staying home, I'm in Houston, everybody is staying home. You walk in the streets, there's nobody there. You don't walk. You know, you drive down the street, there's zero. So what are they doing? Pizza delivery, cakes, cookies, snacks, all carbs. They're doing the worst possible thing in the world. And this looked at, over time, what the carbohydrates did and, and how much. And if you're eating three or four times a day carbohydrates, you're wiping out your immune system up to 20 hours a day. That is horrible, I have not heard anybody on television say this nobody's quoted it all you hear about is a vitamin c in your dreams that'll work uh iv vitamin c different story but they're talking oral zinc yeah makes superoxide dismutase which is a, a big anti uh, uh inflammatory anti-inflammatory uh, it is it, it, it is an anti-inflammatory antioxidant you know that's a big one but your body makes them and that's okay, but if you think that alone is gonna fix this in your dreams. All we're getting today is minor things to do. Um, this virus really isn't even that strong, and the proof is 90% of the people don't even know they have it. How many people getting the flu don't know they have it? Everybody knows they have it, it's boom. So you got to be very careful with these statistics. Everybody is hyper. If you are taking the essential oils, and I'll talk a lot about that in a minute, because that was actually my first paper. Yep. This came up second where I was listening to television with the diabetics because we predicted this, but they were acting like they didn't have a clue. So I have colleagues, and one of my biggest ones, Paul Beatty in Toronto, Canada, mm -hmm. said, Brian, you wait until the younger people and the diabetics start getting a hold of this. They're going to be dropping like flies. And this was two weeks before anything was on television. And I said, yeah, you're right. But I didn't think any more of it. But they don't know this. So I'm hoping everybody watching this will tell their friends, relatives, everybody, and minimize those carbohydrates. You want a little bit, that's fine. But if you get to 20 teaspoons, 20 times 20, it's 400 uh, calories. Okay, 400 calories of carbohydrate, you've just blown out your immune system virtually 100% for two hours and impaired the heck out of it for the next five. Horrible state of affairs. So that's what you don't want to do, is the carbohydrates. The big thing you do want to do is what's called the parent essential fatty acids. And then let me I'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah, but before, here's two before, articles. Yeah, the inactivation of envelope viruses. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to just pause you real quick, Brian. Before you get into the, the parent essential oils and the fatty, uh, essential fatty acids, before you get into that, I just want to I w- I just kind of clarify for those listening right now. So what you're, sure. saying, what you're saying is one of the worst things you can do right now yes. for your health and for, to protect yourself against the coronavirus, one of the worst things you can do is every two to three hours and eat a whole bunch of carbohydrates because that will reduce your body's ability to deal with infections and viruses. It will, let me just go back to the study here. Um, even if you're not diabetic, but you're eating these carbs and it's oh, yeah. equivalent to those teaspoons you recommended, it'll depress the body's production of PGE1, which is the body's most natural anti-inflammatory. That is whether you are diabetic or not, correct? Yes. Okay. You don't need that at all. Diabetes got a big hit, but anybody is going to get a hit. Absolutely. A diabetic can absolutely not afford this because they are one of the largest at-risk populations there is. And this isn't being widespread told at all. They mention it. And then what goes with diabetes? Heart disease. So a diabetic has two to four times the probability of getting a heart problem than a non-diabetic. So they're related. So diabetes is the biggest underlying problem you can have. This is supposed to be a respiratory disease. The people that are dying, that's number three in the population of what illnesses people have. That was third in New York City. Not first. This virus really attacks the respiratory system. But in the people that already have it impaired, it wasn't killing them as much as it was killing the diabetics, which is really surprising if you don't know this this discovery that they just had with doing this study and they're not talking about it. This You're is why, absolutely right. Yeah. So this is why a conversation like this. So, so those of you who are watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, a conversation like this is the conversation you want to share with your friends and your family and get this information out there that can make the biggest difference in the world. Because you shared in the study that if, if somebody is diabetic and they're following the standard nutritionist or dietitian or even a conventional approach to it, yeah. The diet that is recommended by those practitioners, by the American Diabetes Association, what is the equivalent in carbohydrates? Do you know? I, I think you had it. Well, if you, right? what it used to be is 60% carbohydrate diet, 2,000 calories a day, which show me a diabetic doing 2,000 calories. They're eating more. But at 2,000, 60% is 1,200. 1,200 divided by 20 is 60 teaspoons of sugar a day is what your physician has been telling you, which is horrible. So 60 divided by three, that's the 20 teaspoons at a clip. Every four or five hours, you are doing this wiping out your immune system. And actually today, the average American's eating closer to 100. That's why everybody's so big, because it's all going to fat. Carbohydrates go to fats, the insulin response. So number one, you get fat. Number two, you're wiping out your immune system. Number three, you are going to get every ailment there is. And a bad one is a diabetic foot ulcer, which I'm really spending a lot of time with because these are horrible and 25% of the diabetics get those. A friend of mine got his leg chopped off. I mean, of course, he wasn't doing anything with the oils. He didn't, most people don't. (laughs) You know, it's called familiarity breeds contempt. So the hardest ones for any physician or any scientist is to have the closest people around you believe what you've discovered because they know you. Even Jesus couldn't practice in Nazareth. He had to leave. Mm. He had the familiarity too, and he said that. It's unfortunate, but it's psychological law. So it has to be someone that nobody knows tells you something like this. that comes from the family. You have to have a reference. Hey, I didn't learn this on my own. I came up with it from this guy. It's not me. It's him saying it. And that will get you somewhere. But it's tragic to me how many people I can help and they don't listen because they know me. But all the physicians, the same thing, Brian, they start laughing. You're not alone. My family won't listen to me either. Another physician that's half as good as me. <laughs> they listen yeah. to immediately. It's tragic. So we know that if high carbohydrates frequently harm the body, or I should say open you up to susceptibility for the coronavirus and other viruses, then the solution or or, or a couple of the solutions would be a high fat with the right parent essential oils, which we'll get into, and more of intermittent fasting, similar to what you teach about in your 24-hour diet, similar to what I teach about when it comes to keto and fasting, right? Those are powerful solutions, correct? Yes. 
Absolutely. It's a two-step. Minimize a negative and bring in a positive. Two-fold, boom, boom approach. So let's get into these essential fatty acids. I mean, this is a great paper of that. Where, where can the audience go check out these, these papers that you've written? Yeah, it's right on my website. So if it's just my name, Brian, B as in boy, R-I-A-N, P as in parent, E-S-K-I-N.com. And it's right there. The paper's right there. And the carbohydrate one will be coming out soon. It's being typeset right now. So this is a paper that you sent me, or actually Dr. Pompa sent it to me, that you forwarded to him about enhancing your body's ability to fight COVID-19 virus with EFAs. Let's get into this. Yeah, well, there's two things. An EFA stands for essential fatty acid. I don't like the term. It's not acid like your battery acid and you burn your face or sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid. It's a chemical structure. So I like calling them essential parent essential oils or essential fatty acids. There's two, parent omega-6 and parent omega-3. All anybody needs to know is your body can't make either one. You have to get them from food and you need much more of the omega-6 series than the omega-3. In the body, when you do a little bit of algebra, it's 11 fold more parent omega-6 than parent omega-3. So don't let anybody tell you we're overdosed on omega-6. However, we are overdosed on adulterated processed omega-6 because only the omega-6 cooking oils are processed so they don't go bad. Nobody is frying or cooking or baking with flax oil that has omega-3 in it. So nobody does that, it's too reactive. So they use the omega-6 cooking oils. That's, there's a little bit of omega-6 in olive oil, not very much, it's typically worthless as a nutritional supplement but sunflower oil safflower oil the original strains were like 75 percent parent omega-6 now they've converted most of those strains to make them suitable for frying so they're 10 percent omega-6 and they've done people a big injustice they made it convenient for frying and keeping the oils last for a month but they've made it where people are getting more and more susceptible this virus, like I said originally, is not that strong. And the proof is 90%, once again, have no symptoms, no problem whatsoever. They don't even know they have the darn thing compared to a regular flu where you're sicker than heck right off the bat. So this thing is not that strong initially, but our immune system is weaker. And the reason it's weaker is we're overdosing on carbs, wiping it out. And number two, we're not getting these oils. So in the cell membrane, you have 100 trillion of them, 33% to 25% are these parents, a quarter to a third. And it's about five or six to one in most organs. So your muscles, for example, are six and a half to one. We have 100 trillion cells and everyone has a cell membrane in it. And the average, Overall, it's 11 to 1 in favor of parent omega-6. But most of the tissue, for example, muscles, which is 50% of your body, is 6.5 to 1 in favor of parent omega-6. Your heart, liver would be more like 4 to 1. Your fat stores are about 20, 25 to 1 in favor of parent omega-6. So the omega-6 series is 20 times more powerful than omega-3. I know what you're thinking. But fish oil is the be all end oil. Fish oil is a poison. It is a pharmacologic overdose, DHA, EPA, of something your body makes in very limited quantities. The brain, the brain's loaded with it. The half life of DHA, EPA in the brain is two and a half years, which means a little of it stays there. And you better have the antioxidants to keep it there. But this is how little, your brain only needs 7.2 milligrams a day, 7.2. The average fish oil capsule is 1,000 milligrams and 60% fish oil, so that's 600. Compare that with 7.2, and you have physicians telling their poor patient to take four grams a day. It acts like a long-term steroid. Steroids also, just so you know, block the metabolism of the parent essential oils. So they actually impede it. Now, a steroid's okay, very short term. You can ask any physician, what do you think about a long-term steroid for a year? 
they'll shudder in horror, but you have drugs now for skin conditions where they're putting huge populations on steroids for years. And these poor patients have no idea what's happening to them. It's horrible. So the parents are the brick and mortar of every one of your 100 trillion cell membranes. And the way the virus comes in, a coronavirus anyway, it basically breaks in half, opens up, and sticks to the cell membrane. Well, it can't stick real well with the right, fully functional parent omega-6 that hasn't been processed. And processing means you get rid of where it goes bad, doesn't turn rancid. It doesn't transfer oxygen. Okay, the reason oils go bad, you go through the fish market and that smell is rancidity. This is why fish oil goes bad spontaneously at room temperature. They don't tell you this either. I don't even care how much antioxidant you have in the body, it's going bad very fast. And it also displaces all the parent omega-6. That's why your mitochondria are so screwed up and we have no energy. Rampant exhaustion is a big, big problem in America today. We're doing it ourselves. But back to the oils. So the parent omega-6 is the direct precursor of GLA, which makes the PGE-1. So if you have a functionally impaired parent omega-6 oil, you are going to be compromising the PGE-1 process too. You're hurting the enzyme activity, plus you don't have the raw material to make it. You've got a major, major problem. And this is it in a nutshell. It is the adulterated oil. So any restaurant you're going to, unless it's organic, you are going to get functionally impaired omega-6 oils. I don't care if it's the finest restaurant in town, they've been conned too and using canola oil or some kind of oil that's been highly processed so you don't have to throw it out in a few days or a week. They want the stuff lasting for a month. Go to any fast food restaurant, they're getting a month out of those oils. It's horrible. Now the oxygen transfer stops, but we need that. And actually Otto Warburg showed lack of cellular oxygen is the reason for cancer. So we're unknowingly putting cancer through the roof. Of course, you're getting heart attacks through the roof in spite of everything they say about statins. I was around when statins first came out and all the cardiologists were going, oh, heart disease is over. Walk into your cardiologist's office and tell me how many people are sitting in the chairs. It's overflowing. Heart disease over, it is the number one killer. And cancer is coming up close to it because of the processed cooking oils too, so they're neck and neck. Same causes, same exact causes. But you need these oils so they kill the virus on contact. And that's actually what this said. Envelope viruses and killing of cells by fatty acids. And then in 2019, you'll love this, characteristic of lipidomic profile of human coronavirus infected cells, implications for lipid metabolism remodeling and called upon coronavirus re replication. I mean, these are big sentences. They are not clinical. These are, they're not clinical people that typically is, is looking at this like JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet. So the physicians aren't looking at this. It's not a lipids journal, for example. And I'm looking at it, but what they said, the long chain fatty acids like PEOs were the most active and effective antiviral in killing enveloped viruses. Now an envelope virus means it has a lipid around it. And the coronavirus is lipid. They cause disintegration of the membranes resulting in cell death. Antiviral fatty acids were found to affect the viral envelope. So they killed a darn thing. And the second article looked at 24 lipids and they looked at the MERS coronavirus, which had a 34% mortality rate, much worse than this. This isn't even close. Parent omega-6 and arachidonic acid, which is a long chain metabolite of parent omega-6, kills it. And the coronavirus replication, so it can replicate, required a specific composition of cellular lipids and any disruption decreases its effectiveness. So by putting the right oils that mother nature designed us to have, 
the virus can't replicate and you kill it. Significantly suppressed HCOV 229E, which is another coronavirus, which impairs the respiratory system too. They actually looked at these oils on these viruses and significantly suppressed the highly virulent MERS coronavirus. Both of them that killed the 34% of the people. It knocked that out too. So if this is in your system, my goodness, do you have a shield against this virus? And I can't say no one's gonna get it having this, but to me, this is the biggest bang for the buck anybody on the planet will ever get. And there's millions and billions of viruses. This was in 2020. The title was Why the Coronavirus Has Been So Successful. And it was in the Atlantic. And the immune system is supposed to fight back and attack. But when it goes berserk, you get the cytokine explosion I was talking about, where the body's going, this is a foreign invader, boom. It's not supposed to go boom. It's supposed to go whoom, instead of just bang. And that's why your lungs and respiratory system, all of a sudden I was breathing, I'm on a respirator. The attack was too fast. It's kind of counterintuitive. You wouldn't think that would be a bad thing, but it is. So EFAs modulate, those parent oils modulate the rate of attack of your immune system. And they're highly involved in the communication of all the cells. The cells do communicate with each other. And this goes on and on. They've had this link for many years. It also, it hits the T lymphocytes. It's tied to interferon maximization, which interferon is a major immune booster. Here was one that came out in 1992 in the Pharma Letter. EFAs could reform antiviral therapy, including HIV. This was in 1992. Within 12 weeks of EFAs, the patients with HIV had considerable improvement, reduction in fatigue, diarrhea, severity, blah, blah, blah. Significant improvement in the CD4 lymphocyte count. And it goes on and on. Also talks about the antiviral actions of interferon and how they're diminished without the fully functional EFAs. Epstein-Barr virus, which makes you exhausted. That was the mononucleosis, mononucleosis uh, thing a lot of people could have had in college, you know, 30, 40 years ago. They had reduced blood EFA concentrations. 85% of patients improved with EFA treatment. This looked at 63 post-viral fatigue patients with one to three years of illness that were a mess. 85% improvement were improved after three months. No negative effects. Chronic fatigue syndrome, 2005. The oil is reduced. Well, you have reduced killer cell activity, reduced helper cell activity. It, it just goes on and on. Everything your body needs to do is tied to these oils in and of themselves and the way they transport oxygen, nobody is talking about it. Nobody. It's absolutely sinful, Ben. Absolutely sinful. It doesn't I, stop. I agree with you, Brian. I, and, you know, so the first step is to remove the interference, remove the high carbohydrate foods, the frequent eating. Second yes. step is, and also remove the, 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 the adulterated oils, because what we're talking about here are the unadulterated oils. You want to minimize it. So fast food restaurants should be minimized. Instead of a whole thing of French fries, eat a third of them. Instead of, you know, the whole bun, I rip out the inside of it. So I just have the outside of the bun holding the darn meat. You know, I scoop it out. If I'm going to get a sub or a grinder, or whatever you call it, wherever you are, I have them scoop out every possible bit of bread just so I have the end and I stuff the meat and the vegetables in there. But you've got to start doing that because you need bang for the buck with carbohydrates. So if they're not really, really good, you don't want them. It's like a big plate of spaghetti. There's no taste in spaghetti. You have to have the sauce. You have to have butter. You're better off with zucchini spaghetti. The taste difference isn't that much. I'm a big buyer in that now. I wasn't before. But as long as you have a good tomato sauce, you put good Parmesan cheese on it. You don't need the carbohydrate from wheat. Wheat is horrible. So donuts, bagels, oatmeal bread, pasta, that's all wheat. 
And I don't care what kind of weed it is. This is nonsense. The kind from 100 years ago was great. A 1,000 years ago, it makes no difference at all. Carbs are horrible. So where I know the audience wants to know, how could they find these essential fatty acids, these parent, uh, these parent sure, essential oils? Sure, they come in uh, uh, seed oils. So flaxseed, there's more parent omega-3 than parent omega-6, so don't just take flax oil, you'll get sick. Because for example, your skin is 100% omega-6. So if you start taking a lot of fish oil or flax oil, the omega-3 gets thrown into the skin because your body can't burn it all up. So it displaces the parent omega-6, the sun hits it, it gets hot. Remember I told you how rancid it is at room temp? We'll put 100 degrees on your skin. This is skin cancer. And you ask any dermatologist, why is skin cancer going through the roof? We don't know. We tell the patients to put on sunscreen, they still get the cancer, and they do. That's the reason why, because the adulterated oils get forced into the skin because you are overdosing on it. Remember, the brain, 7.2 milligrams, the average poor person is having 600. They are getting a 20 to 500 fold overdose of the omega-3 series EFAs on a daily basis. The equivalent of that would be as stupid as taking 100 aspirins in a clip because two work okay and going, I'm going to take 100, I'll even be better. Don't do it. I'm being very facetious, but you're dead on the spot if you ever did that. We don't die with the fish oil and overdose of omega-3 oils, but they're killing everybody and they're making you much more susceptible to all kinds of problems. A little is okay. You can eat the fish, but remember, fish oil and oils are processed foods. They're squeezing. So they're juicing a fish. It's not a natural product and they are concentrating those oils. That would never be done if you make it. So for example, if you bake fish, most of the oil is gone, especially in a lean fish, it drips out. And again, for diabetics, the lean fish was much better for glucose control. People eating fish and taking fish oil have very bad glucose control. It makes it worse. So once again, the exact opposite of what you hear, read a phenomenal article a year or two back the mitochondrial enzymes of the heart are up to 50% impaired on people taking fish oil in humans. That means the heart doesn't have the energy to pump. That's going to give you a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we are being told to do the complete wrong things. You need organic, fully functional oils, more omega-6, then omega-3, just the parents, your body will make the omega-3 derivatives like EPA and DHA. I've read studies where they gave vegetarians that eat no fish, that get, gets, the DHA EPA has to come from marine sources. There are no land sources that have it because your body is made to produce it as needed. There's different populations that consume no fish oil, and there's no cognitive problems, there's no visual problems, there are no problems at all. Your body makes enough just fine. The Omega-6 series is a completely different story because you need that PGE-1, you need the arachidonic acid made. You can get arachidonic acid from food, from meat, but your body will also make it if you're not consuming it, if you have the parents. And that is the key to everything. So. Walnut oils, they say, oh, it's the omega-3 in the walnut oils. Why Seventh-day Adventists are so great. You got five times more parent omega-6 oils in there. It's not the omega-3 at all making them great. Like I said, your skin is 100% omega-6 parent. And I hear people go, oh, I take fish oil, my skin's smoother now. What? How? That's absolutely impossible. This is why this anecdotal stuff, you got to be very careful of. People get misled. For decades, the OBGYNs were telling women take, you know, prescription hormone therapy and that reduces cancer. It actually, when they did the real study, gave them cancer. They had a, you know, it, it was the exact, only in the medical profession do you get a recommendation that later on is found out to be 180 degrees opposite. Yeah. Not a little off, completely backwards. Take lots of this and actually it's killing you. 
it's very, very tragic. So sunflower seeds, evening primrose oil is excellent for GLA. That's the immediate precursor to PGE1. So you bypass that delta-6 to saturus enzyme that could be impaired. So you are giving a diabetic and everybody else as much PGE1 as they need. Your body will make it even though it's impaired by that little trick. So evening primrose oil, coconut oil is very good as a natural preservative to preserve these oils in the cell membrane when you eat it. And these oils go right into the cell itself before they even do anything else. They're the brick and mortar of the cell. Remember, 25 to 33%, they make it. But they have to be fully functional. You need organic, cold-pressed, more parent omega-6 than omega-3. You want GLA, evening primrose is the best. Borage oil, a lot of people use, it's much cheaper. It's 24% GLA, so your average person would go, gee, why do I want evening primrose? When I press it, it's only 10% GLA. When I get this borage oil, it's 24%. Well, there's a component that gets made by your body from boxane A2, which makes your platelets stick together. So it's got a very bad effect, and this was hushed up. So you do not want an EFA supplement that has borage oil in it. So those are the big ones. Um, there's about five criteria for it. There's very few people that do it, but the ones that do it properly, the results that are obtained are just off the charts because I go by the science. The science has to predict how it works in the clinic. And the pharmacy companies and the physicians seem to go backwards. They just look in the clinic and then they try and go backwards. That doesn't work. The science has to show the way. So I am one of the few that follows the science. And then of course, so I'm a theoretician. Then of course, it has to work in the clinic, but the results we get are just phenomenal. With blood flow increase, lack of heart disease, lack of getting the flu. Most of the people that follow what I tell them, it's extremely rare anybody gets the flu. And if they do get it at all, it's a couple of days and they're right back. Nobody gets it like seven to 10 days that I'm aware of. And I've been doing this for a long time. And a lot of people have my email address and they let me know if something doesn't work the way it should work. But it's very, very exciting to be able to offer this, especially now if people aren't taking these oils, they're absolutely crazy. Yeah, and Brian. hour 50 a day tops. They're crazy. That's all it is. It's a can of soda for crying out loud. Um, you know, a candy bar. Anything is a buck fifty a day. And you will have superb optimization of your immune system. And that's the best you can get. You know, it's just the best you can get. This message is so important because it's not what most practitioners are speaking about. I've interviewed, I've interviewed a lot of people on my show and some of them yeah. promote fish oil to this day. And we know that they that's the, the, prop, the popular consensus is to promote that. And I used to promote it myself uh, until I came across your research, Dr. Pablo's yeah. research, and I totally changed my stance and I switched over to these PEOs, these parent essential oils, these essential fatty acids. And I personally... I'm double upping, double dosing my essential fatty acids right now because of the Smart coronavirus. Mode. So Smart I'm mode. taking, so if, if you uh, listeners and viewers, if you go to ketocampkit.com, I actually put a, together a kit of the essential fatty acids that I'm consuming personally. So I'm consuming a product called Pureform. I'm consuming a product called Andrea Seed Oils, and I'm consuming different, um, uh, different substances of these fats that are cold processed organic that feed the cells, the cell membrane, the building blocks it needs to fight viruses, to, to do the things we want it to do. And I'd love for you, Brian, to speak a little bit more about, you mentioned it earlier, but oxygen. These oils help the body deliver oxygen to the cells. Why is that important? So go a little bit deeper on that. Yeah, yeah. what got me very early into this whole field is the work of Otto Warburg. He was the greatest physiologist, biochemist of the 20th century. MD, PhD, his father was a phenomenal theoretical physicist. And this guy was incredible. Won a Nobel Prize, too. He would not publish something unless he verified it 10 times. What we get today in the medical journals is somebody gets a result and they can't duplicate it. 
this happens about 80, 90% of the time. The big reason is it was an anomaly. It's not the real result because the science wouldn't even predict it. But they publish the darn thing because everybody is in such a race to publish. And if you're an academic at a university or even a hospital, they rate you on how much publishing in the medical journals there is. And that is a very big problem because people publish garbage. And even in APAL, she was the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, one of the two. She resigned. She, she couldn't take it anymore. She goes, we're publishing garbage. that shouldn't even be published. But nobody's giving us the quality that we should. So Warburg's work was phenomenal. And he first proved lack of cellular oxygen, not in the bloodstream. Okay, everybody has fine oxygen in the bloodstream, in the cell, intermittent decrease of 35%, meaning I can have oxygen and then it's down a third. Oxygen and it's down a third, cancer. And that was verified in America in 1953 and 1955, Goldblatt and Cameron, brilliant work. All the hearts that they deprived the oxygen to develop cancer and the heart tissue that had full oxygen got no cancer. So the mitochondria is where the oxygen transfer in the cell is taking place. Now in the membrane itself, remember the oils make 25% to 33%, it's the structure. What people miss is the oxygen in those oils, the parent omega-6 in particular, can come out of that. So it's called disassociation, it actually comes out. So it's not just the oxygen transfer in and out from the bloodstream, it's from the cell membrane itself, it can help. So you get two effects. And actually Campbell in 1976 wrote about this and I've never seen anything modern day referencing his work. He was looking at cystic fibrosis patients which have an oxygen problem and they're exhausted and they typically die very young. But a brilliant work and it was like, my goodness, this is guaranteeing Warburg is right, but nobody at the time knew why you would have that impaired oxygen deficiency at the cell membrane level. Campbell talked about it, but he didn't, and back then there wasn't the level of adulteration that we have today. All the oils in a regular supermarket, unless you're going to an organic supermarket, are processed and the oxygen transferring component is highly impaired to a large extent. And that is the biggest problem that we have today. So when you have that lack of oxygen, you either kill the cell, like if I strangle you, you're probably gonna die if I keep going and going and going. But if I give you just a little bit of breath, you may be able to spring back. You may be permanently impaired, it just depends. Regarding the cell, if it can survive lack of oxygen for a little bit, it can convert over to what's called glycolysis. And that is getting energy like a yeast would. And a yeast is pretty damn dumb. So all it does is it grows and grows and grows. And what's a yeast growing? Sugar, right? Little bit of warm water, dump in the sugar, dump in the yeast, boom. And I use yeast to leaven bread, right? It's a leavening ingredient. Rises a pizza if you want to put it in the dough. So the cell is actually not using the oxygen because it can't. Its mitochondria is ruined. And cardiolipid in the mitochondria is 100% parent omega-6. This is talked about, but no one is hitting the nail on the head going, okay, it's all adulterated for crying out loud from what people are eating. That's the perfect explanation right there. That's heart disease, cancer, exhaustion. So I mean, when you right there, but nobody's focusing on that. So the oxygen transfer is all tied to the omega-6. The omega-3 is insignificant. It's not used. There's reasons for that that are technical. It doesn't matter much. It's where it disassociates with the partial pressure of oxygen, hemoglobin, and different technical things from chemistry, from biochemistry, organic chemistry. It's the omega-6 series. That's what 
everybody in the world is missing because they're all focused on this fish oil nonsense, which by the way is all getting reversed. Every study they do shows fish oil fails, you know, from about 2010 on out. And most of the studies aren't worth the paper they're printed on, but Cochrane did a huge one. They're the best study analyzer in the world. They looked at hundreds of studies. Most of them were absolute garbage. That's my joke. The study's not worth the paper it's printed on. From what you just said, I know the study can't say that. I don't even need to see another word. Don't waste my damn time. I'm busy. <laughs> this happens all the time. They picked 20. And out of the 20, complete failure from helping the heart, from helping cognitive ability, from helping visual, macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, dementia, you name it. Absolute failure, which once again proves you're getting all the DHA, EPA you need normally without the garbage. You don't need it. Even the baby from the mother with mother's milk, the DHA, EPA will be increased naturally. So mother nature knows what she's doing, but then it goes back down. So that's how the baby gets it. You go, oh, it doesn't matter too much. Where the heck's the baby getting it? The hormones change when a woman's pregnant, in case you missed that. <laughs> it's called morning sickness. It's called cravings. It's everything's changed. But there's very, very big hormonal changes, and the body will take care of that. Also, any pregnant women need to know those parent essential oils, those critical essential EFAs, will all get taken from you into the baby. Nature's brutal in that respect. You pop out the kid. That's the new life. It's younger. You're more expendable. This is precisely why most women, it's been a year and I'm still exhausted. It's been a year. I have stretch marks. They're still a mess. I have this condition. I have that condition because the baby took DFAs. If he could get them from you, but if you have DFAs, you breastfeed, or if you give your baby these EFAs in liquid, they don't have the coughs. They don't have the colds. Their immune system works the way it's supposed to be. They don't have any of the skin conditions are rampant in newborns now. So it's critical. And a lot of this is tied to the increased oxygen. And once again, for immunity, any physician will tell you oxygen, oxygen. Co-author of PEO solution is Dr. Rowan. He's a master of, of ozone treatment. Now this is in the bloodstream. It's not breathing it, which is still great to kill things in the air. I have an ozonator in my house and it kills yeast, spores, it makes it where they can't cause any problem. We'll kill viruses too. You can also ionize them. But he's a big, big advocate of the oxygen in the bloodstream kills it. Hydrogen peroxide in the bloodstream. Drinking it does nothing. So we keep getting misled. They take a seat at the science where something does work and then they act like you could just take it. Like glutathione capsules is a big thing. Your body's going to make it. It's going to make superoxide dismutase. It makes these. It doesn't need your help for antioxidants. They don't work the way you're told. And the proof of it is, how can everybody be taking this stuff and everybody's sicker than heck? And everybody is sicker than heck. The only difference today is you may have a heart attack and get to have a second one before you're dead or a third one. They can postpone it. They don't stop you from getting it. The contraction rates of cancer aren't way down. I mean, they're actually up and the deaths are up too. They mislead you on this. I read a hellacious article, I never saw anybody pick it up, that the rates were actually up the past couple of years of death because they're treating people more heavily. And chemotherapy, for example, wipes out your whole immune system. This is known, it wipes out the PGE1. Now they're stuck with it. They don't know what else to do with them. They don't know about my oils that you know, I've spent so much time researching, but they're giving you the best they got, but it's also harming you at the same time. It's like a steroid. It completely destroys the FA metabolism. So you're not gonna get the GLA. You're not gonna get the arachidonic acid. You're not getting everything nature designed you to get. It's okay short term for two weeks, you know, a steroid, but you do not wanna be taking it much longer than that. So these oils are just absolutely critical. They're oxygen magnets. That's what I tell people. Think of it as oxygen. And one more thing, cholesterol is the transporter of these oils. So what happens if you're on a statin drug, which most people are today in America? It knocks down the functional oils. It also knocks down the adulterated ones because they're tied together. The 
answer is not to press them both because knocking down the bad ones is good, but you've also harmed the patient by knocking down the good ones, which is bad. The answer is take more of the fully functional unprocessed oils and then you can still have some junk because people are gonna go to fast food places and you can, you can go there once a week. It's not, I can't have this ever, I can't have that ever again. No, you can have some junk as long as you're bringing in some of the good stuff. And Lands actually in 1990 did brilliant analysis. He's a biochemist. He got this right. He's another fish oil guy because they all jump on that wrongly. That's why you need to be steeped in physiology, not biochemistry. But he showed the consumption goes into the cell and the tissue in proportion to what you eat. Simply means if I eat 80% good oils, I have 80% good oils in my cell membrane. I'm in darn good shape. If I eat 80% fast food, adulterated, processed food oils, I've got 80% junk in my cell membrane. Heart attack, cancer, diabetes, absolutely in your future. These oils also make insulin more effective because they're in the cell membrane. So they make all the hormones that go in and out of that cell more effective, which is a big, big thing. And people aren't talking about that. The PGE1 receptor is down, way down in diabetics by 40%. So there at the cell level is an impairment. This was published. I have it in PL Solution. It's in my book. And nobody talks about it. So everybody is focusing over here. And the answer is over here. It's like I lost my keys and I'm looking under the street light. And you go, where'd you lose your keys? Oh, I lost them over here. But why are you looking under the light over here? Because that's where the light is. I can't see anything over here. Stupid. And unfortunately, this is the medical profession. Instead of sectioning everybody off that was highly at risk for this disease, they took the approach, general population, shutting down an entire country, which to me is utter insanity. And again, this is as a group of species, we are ruining ourselves. This virus should not be hurting anywhere close to the number of people it's hurting if you worked properly and if these poor people had these oils in them. It's as simple as that. It's really tragic that they don't know this and they're looking at half the drugs they do are also steroids. They're steroidal activity, so they're gonna long-term hurt the patient. And then you go into the hospital, what kind of food do they give you? Well, they give you something like a liquid food and all the oil is processed. Used to be high sugar too. Now they stopped doing that because people complain too much. Used to be 20 teaspoons of sugar in a can. But the oils are all processed. So they're killing you, giving you the wrong oils in the hospital. And they're also overdosing you on carbs because they're cheap. Take a look at the average patient's food carbs, carbs, and more carbs because they're cheap, just like a prison population. Cheap is what they want to give you. So it's a tragic state of affairs, but people should not fear this corona thing if they're getting these oils. And, and the science shows it. I'm not, I, I don't take this lightly. You listen to me. My comment is you put your life in my hands. If I steered you wrong, I'd be shot and I deserve it. Most medical professionals will not say that because everything with them is a guess. We think this, it should be that. You know, here's our original prediction is 2 million, and now it's down to 20,000. You know, in England, they were talking, you know, 200,000 people dying of this thing. Now it's down to 20,000. It's not going in the epidemic numbers. It should be. The people that get it, and there's 10 times more people that have it, again, 90%, no symptoms. It's not a very strong thing, but it can get a hold on you and grow and grow and grow if you don't have these oils. So it's a two-edged thing. It doesn't hit you fast, but because it goes slow, it can build up to, you know, it, 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 it can get people that are at risk and it's easy to make yourself not at risk. You know, so Brian. Yeah. So you don't think that we should have shut down the economy. Do you, you don't think we should have self quarantined? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Absolutely not. I think it was the, the stupidest thing you could have ever done. But think about this, because people are unemployed and they're not going to have money. They're not going to have food and they're not going to have the access to drugs and they're in panic mode. If you're in panic mode, your immune system goes down to nothing too, by the way. 
Now, these oils make it where you can't get too upset because they balance your endocrine system superbly because all your endocrine hormones are tied to cholesterol and these are tied to the cholesterol. So you can never get, but if you're in panic mode, you're always on. When you're on, what are you doing? You're burning up oxygen. A foot on the accelerator of my car and a foot on the brake. I'm still burning up the gasoline and I'm gonna blow up the engine. So I think it was the stupidest thing they could have possibly done personally. Um, the numbers to me, and I'm in a small group, are not the epidemic that we're led to believe. 250 each day without it growing to 250, 800, 2000. Believe me, I don't wanna see that. I'm just saying when you look at this, this doesn't warrant the epidemic. It's not the Black Plague. It's not the Spanish flu that wasn't even from Spain. And that was not transmitted from person to person the way they said. I just read a beautiful study about that. Turns out it's highly tied to electricity. And what just came out now is the 5G. Yes. So the human body, I'm an electrical engineer by training. I like bioelectrical engineering. We are completely electrical. The chemical aspect is only there to feed the electrical. Even hearing, for example, they used to think was fluid dynamics and liquid based and volume based and mechanical engineering based. It's not, it's all electrical, it's piezoelectric cells. So most of what they're saying is wrong and they, they just don't know it because medicine takes 20 to 30 years to actually catch up to the medical science. But this whole thing to me is not doing what it should be doing, it's meaning killing 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 uh, very quickly to warrant this. I'm not saying it's okay to have people die, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying the solution is ultimately going to be seen as worse than the problem because of the people that don't have money, the people that don't have access to drugs. And a lot of that is diabetics. You should see what insulin costs. If they don't get the insulin, their blood sugar stays high and they're at major risk for everything. So it's a, called an unintended consequence because people haven't thought this out, but you have all these medical professionals and what do you do? If you're in the army, I wanna kill people. I'm trying to kill people. Give me somebody to kill. Well, if you're sitting on the lines and you're a big virologist with in, infectious disease, what do you wanna do? You wanna have your work out there so you can be stopping the infectious disease. Doesn't mean you're gonna make the right decisions. I don't care how brilliant you are. But I look at the real life results and to me, these numbers, especially if you're in the Midwest or something where there's not a pile of international travel that came in from this darn thing, why are you shutting everything down out there? That is about as dumb as you could possibly get. Um, I don't care about the number of people infected with it because how many people are infected with the flu and how many people are infected with the common cold? It's called the common cold because everybody gets it, but it goes away, it doesn't do much. But with big numbers, then there's gonna be more chance of having small numbers get really bad. And that's the only thing with that. But the infection rate doesn't mean anything to me. It's, can you deal with it? Right now you have pneumonia in your mouth, for example. You don't have any lung problem with pneumonia. You're not running off to the hospital, why? Because your immune system can deal with that normal amount of pneumonia in your mouth. It's as simple as that. It's just, we're living in a world of insanity. We're living in a world of social media where people care about, I'll be criticized for this. Even Trump said that. If we didn't do this, we'd be criticized. So you're doing the wrong thing because you'll be, even him. Yeah, the answer is yeah, we're gonna do the wrong thing. And then what they're gonna do is go, oh, should have been 200,000 people die. Uh, I, I predict it's gonna be under 50,000 in America. I don't even think it's gonna be that. And I'm not saying this gleefully. I'm just saying they're so darn wrong I think it's gonna be less than 20,000. And there's, there's reasons for that. But if you take this, you should not be having problems with this. You, you just shouldn't. Now, another reason with this corona, this particular one, it attacks the upper and lower respiratory at the same time. Yeah. Most other viruses don't, they go one way, they either go up or they go down. So at least half your lung has a chance. This thing hits it both. So again, if your immune system isn't up there, or if you have this cytokine release, overdosing, where if you get a problem and it's just unleashing everything, that ends up killing you. Uh, this modulates it. 
So I, I, I wish the medical profession knew about EFAs. They don't. They honestly don't. It's tragic. So again, it's a grassroots movement, but that's how the ketogenics thing came. Grassroots, that didn't come from the medical profession. That came by people such as yourself saying, hey, medical profession, you guys are failing. Diabetes is through the roof. Sickness is through the roof. Your high-carbohydrate diet is killing everybody. And the numbers show it. And after 20 years of that, which it's been, you can't deny it anymore. That's the only reason this came about. It's not because they said, oh, the error of my ways. They're just going, my God, it doesn't pan out. And again, I'm a scientist, so I look at the theory first. But then, but if you get these oils, it's as good as you can get. Somebody said, here's a million bucks, do with the maximum you can. The oils and then the best detoxifier in the world in the bloodstream is called SEAC. I'm a big believer in that too. So there's really three like things. SEAC, like SEAC. Oils, minerals, and the detoxifier. So Brian, it's a pretty hard thing, but the oils are number one. So Brian, uh, we're, we're out of time here. I want to thank yeah. you for your expertise, your brilliance. Um, you are a man who is delivering a message that is that needs to be heard around the world. And I'll do my part in sharing this message as much as possible. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love your work. Go check out Dr. Uh, excuse me, Brian Peskin's work over at brianpeskin.com and get his book, The 24-Hour Diet. Get his book, The PEO Solution. I'm going to put links for all of your information down below and we'll do another episode this is your second time on the show episode 45 was the first one this is the second one we'll do a follow-up to this we'll talk more about the cell membrane and more of the new research that'll come out that i'm sure you'll be all over and i want to thank you for your time today i really learned a lot and i had a blast with you brian so thank you for today my pleasure to the best of my knowledge uh nobody can explain the diabetic thing so you will be one of the first in the world to have your audience understand why that happened Awesome. Thanks for having me.